Welcome to Mikunst Hardware. Recently I'm getting a lot of questions such as which graphics card should I pick for this processor? Will this graphics card bottleneck my CPU? Will this CPU bottleneck this graphics card? Unfortunately, there is no answer for this question. Everything is dependent on what you're gonna use your computer for, which games you're gonna play, what is your screen resolution, and what is your targeted FPS mark. Still, in this video I'm going to try and see which CPU is good to pair with which graphics card for gaming. This is also relevant because recently I have migrated from my 3 Draper 1950X to Xeon E5 2690V3. For the graphics card I am using RTX 2080 Ti, it's the same graphics card which I am using to test CPUs. Unfortunately, I was not able to get a Core i9, which is the best gaming CPU on the market right now for this test. That's why I have used the best CPU I had on my hands, and it is Core i7-8700K. The other tested CPUs are Xeon E5 2620v3, it's an ultra-budget option and you can still buy this CPU for less than 20 euros. The other popular CPU I have tested is Xeon E5 2678v3. It would be really nice to add Xeon E5 1650v3 overclocked to 4.2-4.3 GHz, but unfortunately I do not have time to test 4 CPUs. For the graphics card I am going to test GTX 1660 Super as an entry-level graphics card, high-end graphics card is GTX 1080 Ti, and ultra-high-end is RTX 2080 Ti. Before I go into the test results, let me stress a few things. First of all, for this video I have made more than 100 benchmarks. I have tested each configuration three times and took the average value as the final result. It took me a few weeks to complete these benchmarks, because I have a full-time job and I cannot sit from the morning to the evening testing these games. Unfortunately, this means that during this time a few of the tested games received a few updates. Windows was also updated once or twice, I don't even remember. Another issue that I have met is that my DDR4 memory sticks by the end of the test refused to keep working at DDR4 1866-CL9. I had to increase the memory latency to CL10. It could be the reason why in a few tests GTX 1660 Super showed better results than GTX 1080 Ti. Anyway, let's take a look at the detailed hardware specification and then go into the test results. Xeon E5-2620v3 and E5-2678v3 were tested on a Huanan GX99TF motherboard. Both of the CPUs were Turbo Boost unlocked, thus E5-2620v3 worked at 3.2 GHz on all cores, while E5-2678v3 worked at 3.3 GHz on all cores. Core i7-8700K was tested on an Asus Prime Z370P motherboard. Unfortunately, the CPU was tested without any overclocking. First, I tried to test the CPU with 5 GHz overclock, but the disgusting toothpaste that Intel has put under the lid of the CPU just did not let me cool this CPU down. Even if I try to use a huge Noctua and HD15 cooler, the CPU overheats to 99 plus degrees Celsius and the system crashes. That's why I would have to either delete the CPU and replace the disgusting Intel toothpaste with something reasonable, or I had to use the default stock configuration. All three CPUs were tested with the G-Skill DDR4 memory modules. 4 modules, 8GB each, DDR4 3200 CL14. With the Xeon E5-2620V3 it was DDR4-1866, with the Xeon E5-2670 it was DDR4-2133, and with the i7-8700K it was DDR4-3400. The rest of the components in the system were identical for all of the CPUs tested. For this video I have picked a few completely different games which behave completely differently under the same circumstances. Some of the games rely on the CPU performance, others rely on the GPU performance. All of the games were tested at 1080p and 1440p, medium graphical preset as well as ultra graphical preset. In this video I am only going to look at the results of the ultra graphical presets, but if you are curious to see how the CPUs perform with the medium graphical settings, you can take a look at the My Google Slides presentation and the link will be available in the video description. Let's start with Red Dead Redemption 2. First, I thought of excluding this game from my test because it is providing very inconsistent minimal FPS results. But it's only one game which is using Vulkan API on my list, that's why I have decided to keep it even though the minimal FPS values are very inconsistent. At 1080p and ultra graphical settings we can see that GTX 1660 Super provides exactly the same performance with all three CPUs. 
GTX 1080 Ti provides the same average FPS with all three CPUs. With RTX 2080 Ti, Core i7-8700K is taking the lead with 104 FPS on average, E5-26-7080 is taking the second play with 100 FPS, and E5-26-20 takes the last place, 96 FPS. Thus we can see that Red Dead Redemption 2, especially with ultra graphical settings, is very GPU demanding. Basically, the performance is limited by the graphics card. Much the same can be seen if we increase the screen resolution to 1440p. Here, 1660 Super and 1080 Ti are providing identical performance with all three CPUs. Using NVIDIA RTX 2080 Ti, Core i7-8700K is able to slightly go over A5-2678 and E5-2620 V3. The next game is Far Cry New Dawn. Unlike Red Dead Redemption 2, this game is using maximum 1.5 CPU cores. At 1080p resolution, ultra graphical settings, Xeon E5 CPUs are providing exactly the same values with all graphics cards 5558 minimal FPS, 7782 FPS on average. Core i7 8700K slightly increases its performance with GTX 1080 Ti over 1660 Super, 87 FPS on average with 1660, 100 FPS on average with 1080 Ti. But RTX 2080 Ti is not able to bring anything on the table. Core i7-8700K is the bottleneck here. Increase in resolution to 1440p and we still see almost identical picture. All three CPUs are not able to keep up with the 1080 Ti and 2080 Ti, while GTX 1660 Super is fully loaded with all three CPUs. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This is a really weird game. It is using all of the CPU cores but does it in a very strange way. There is a CPU load, but the performance is not that good. Anyway, with the GTX 1660 Super we see identical performance between all three CPUs. With the GTX 1080 Ti the gap between CPUs is starting to grow. Especially it's noticeable when we look at the minimal FPS. E5-2620 does not improve its value compared to 1660 Super, it stays at 28 minimal FPS, Xeon E5-2678 improves it to 35, and i7-8700K improves it to 45. The same applies to the average FPS. Using RTX 2080 Ti at 1080p resolution with these three CPUs does not make much sense. Even though the performance is slightly higher, the difference is negligible. 8700K is able to increase average FPS to 87, but the minimal FPS is still staying at 45. Increasing the resolution to 1440p and we can see that GTX 1080 Ti doesn't really bother about which CPU is used, the values are about the same. Minimal FPS is still better with Core i7-8700K, but the average FPS is about the same for all three CPUs. At this resolution RTX 2080 Ti is finally getting some use and Core i7-8700K is able to push Average FPS 272 compared to 58 with the GTX 1080 Ti. Both Xeons are staying behind Core i7, but the difference is not that big. F1 2019 DirectX 12 API 1080p Ultra Graphical Preset. Here we can see the GTX 1660 Super doesn't really bother about which CPU is used, 120 FPS for minimum and 160 FPS on average. Switching to GDX 1080 Ti, we can see that CPUs are starting to pull away from 2620 V3. 2620 is not able to improve its performance at all, E5 2678 V3 is not able to push 1080 Ti to its limits, while i7-8700K is able to push 1080 Ti to 200 FPS on average. Switching to RTX 2080 Ti does not bring anything extra on the table. All three CPUs are staying at exactly the same levels as with 1080 Ti. Thus, in this game, with this resolution, even Core i7-8700K will bottleneck RTX 2080 Ti. Increase in resolution to 1440p, and here, E5-2678 V3 is able to push 1080 Ti to its limits, it provides the same performance as Core i7-8700K. 120 minimal FPS, 155 average FPS. Xeon E5-2620 V3 is able to improve its performance compared to the GTX 1660 Super, but is not able to match 2678 and i7-8700K. RTX 2080 Ti at 1440p is able to pull away from Xeon E5-2678 V3 with i7-8700K. 
The difference is not that huge, 130 minimal FPS against 142 minimal FPS, 165 averages against 176 averages. If i2620 v3 is losing to both of the CPUs and staying about at the same level as 1080 Ti. CSGO or Counter-Strike Global Offensive Unfortunately, I do not enjoy to play this game for the sake of benchmarking and I do not have time to play replays from some other players. That's why I have used Steam Workshop Benchmark. If you consider it to be not representative or not interesting, feel free to skip to the next game. Nevertheless, Steam Workshop Benchmark provides the same minimal FPS with all three CPUs and all three graphical cards. With all three GPUs, i7-8700K is leading over Xeon CPUs quite significantly. But RTX 2080 Ti is only able to provide the same level of performance as GTX 1080 Ti. Thus, i7-8700K is not able to push RTX 2080 Ti any further than GTX 1080 Ti. Nevertheless, I'm not quite sure how reasonable this comparison is. If even E5 2620 and GTX 1660 Super are able to deliver 265 FPS on average. Increasing resolution to 1440p, we can see that here GTX 1660 Super is the bottleneck, results are pretty much identical with all three CPUs. Going to 1080 Ti, we again see i7 8700K pulling ahead, E5 2678v3 in the middle, and 2620 takes the last place. Throwing in RTX 2080 Ti does not bring any extra performance. All CPUs are providing almost identical performance compared to GTX 1080 Ti. Shadow of the Tomb Raider This is a very well-optimized game, but it's also very demanding. It's demanding for the CPU and GPU performance. With the DirectX 12 API, 1080p, ultra graphical settings, GTX 1660 Super provides exactly the same level of performance with all three CPUs. With the GTX 1080 Ti, i7-8700K is starting to pull away, especially if we take a look at the minimal FPS values. E5 2678v3 delivers only 72 FPS for minimum, while i7-8700K increases this value to 96. Average FPS is rather similar, 115 and 122 FPS on average. Replacing 1080 Ti with RTX 2080 Ti shows a bit of a different picture. Here, E5 2678v3 is able to catch up with i7-8700K on averages, but the minimal FPS is still staying the same, 72 and 90. E5 2620v3 is almost unable to improve its performance with RTX 2080 Ti, compared to GTX 1080 Ti. Increasing the resolution to 1440p, and we see almost identical picture with a shift. Now, GTX 1080 Ti and the GTX 1660 Super are providing almost identical performance with all three CPUs, while RTX 2080 Ti demonstrates that Core i7-8700K is a better gaming CPU. Xeon i5 2678v3 doesn't lose that much, but if we look at the minimal FPS, it's again 74 and 92. The difference is rather big, about 25-30%. Ostrif, OpenGL API, 1080p, ultra graphical settings. This game is still under development and at the moment it's able to use only 1.5 CPU cores. Here with all graphics cards we are CPU bottlenecked. Xeon CPUs are showing almost identical performance, while Core i7-8700K pulls ahead. Basically, the same picture can be seen at 1440p. Performance difference between all the GPUs is almost negligible, while Core i7-8700K is pulling significantly ahead over the Xeon CPUs. Battlefield 5, DirectX 11, 1080p, Ultra Graphical Preset, The Lost Tiger Mission. Here, GTX 1660 Super once again provides the same performance with all three CPUs. Here, GTX 1660 Super provides exactly the same performance with all three CPUs. Switching to GTX 1080 Ti, E5 2678 and i7 8700K are providing the same level of performance, while E5 2620v3 starts to lose to the other two CPUs. 67 minimal FPS against 80 FPS, 113 average FPS against 125 FPS from Xeon E5 2678 and i7-8700K. Moving to RTX 2080 Ti, we can see that here i7-8700K is able to slightly pull ahead over Xeon E5 2678v3, while Xeon E5 2620v3 is not able to improve its performance against 1080 Ti at all.
increasing the resolution to 1440p and here GTX 1660 Super and GTX 1080 Ti are providing about the same level of performance with all three CPUs. Xeon i5 2620v3 has slightly worse minimal FPS with the 1080 Ti compared to 2678v3 and i7-8700K and starts to fall behind even further with RTX 2080 Ti. But i5 2678v3 staying neck to neck with Core i7-8700K even with RTX RTX 2080 Ti. The last test for this video is World of Tanks and Core. Here we can see that all three CPUs are providing basically identical results with all three graphics cards. Even at 1440p, all CPUs are delivering about the same level of performance regardless of the graphics card. Basically, World of Tanks and Core is GPU limited and it relies on the graphics card performance more than on the CPU performance. After going through all of these benchmarks, I can make the following conclusion. First of all, there is no ideal configuration for all sort of games and all sort of workloads. It's possible to have a perfect combination of CPU plus GPU for one certain game. But exactly the same combination will not be perfect for another game. Either CPU will not be keeping up with the GPU or GPU will not be keeping up with the CPU. And there will be so-called bottleneck. But in general, with the Xeon i5 2620v3, I would not recommend to go any higher than GTX 1660 Super or GTX 1070. If you are looking for the AMD graphics cards, then it's RX Vega 56 and RX 5600 XT. For Xeon i5 2678v3, my maximum recommendation would be RTX 2060 Super, RTX 2070, GTX 1080. From the AMD side is RX Vega 64 and RX 5700. You can stretch it a little bit further and install GTX 1080 Ti or RTX 2070 Super or RX 5700 XT, but in this case, the CPU will not be able to keep up with the GPU in some games. For Core i7-8700K, maximum recommended GPU would be GTX 1080 Ti, RTX 2070 Super, RTX 2080, 2080 Super. If you would like to use RTX 2080 Ti, which is today's fastest graphics card, then I would strongly recommend to overclock i7-8700K to 4.95 GHz. Unfortunately for this, you will need a really good CPU cooler, and you might need to delete the CPU and replace the disgusting Intel toothpaste with something more applicable, for example Noctua thermal paste. Anyway, after this video I hope there will be less questions about what is going to bottleneck what and which graphics card is going to fit which CPU, but even if it's not going to reduce the number of these questions, I hope you have enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, goodbye.